from a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, the history and ominous nature of Z Coil Footwear. And now, the podcast host who has no need for Z Coils with so many different pairs of Crocs and so little shame, Pete Dominic. What the hell is Z-Coil? The steel coils can last a lifetime through rubber heel pad, will probably last between six months and two years with normal use. What the hell is a Z-Coil shoe? It helps runners who experience lower back pain. The primary purpose is to reduce impact in various types of foot, leg, and back pain. I don't know about these, but I think I just did a, a live read for them. Are, are they? Do they actually do anything? Is this a thing? Why does Pete Coe know about it? And how many emails and responses did I get on his appearance alone yesterday? Everybody loves Senator Mallory McMorrow. No one was surprised by that. But they were surprised that I had Pete on. They didn't know he was going to join me. Folks didn't. And then I think the, the depth that we went with Pete and that he went. So many amazing emails. Such great feedback. Thank you very much, Pete, for Joining me, one of our favorite listeners, Kim in Iowa, Kim Nyborg, uh, writes, Tuesday and Wednesday episodes so good. Warranted an email. I just love the trio on Tuesday with Jay Black and Noel Kasler. By the way, they're going to be joining me again, it looks like, uh, tomorrow during the panel. And we might go live. So check that out on, on Twitter at all of our Twitter handles. She writes, such a thoughtful panel and hilarious to boot. When you talked about other people to have on together, I thought, how about Jared Yates Sexton and Sarah Kenzie or Ryan Bussey and Shannon Watts or Ellie Mistal and Glenn Kirshner? Great ideas, Kim. Keep them coming, folks. She also writes, uh, Mallory McMorrow is amazing. She's everything I ever want to be as an adult, an ally, an actual decent fucking human being. The government needs more of her. The world needs more of her. But finally, I didn't think it was possible for me to like Pete Coe more than I already did. I love this community. I'm so grateful for you to bring us together, for introducing me to such funny, smart, thoughtful, interesting human beings. Kim, thank you very much for your email. I really appreciate it. And also, while I'm at it reading emails, Barbara, Barbara P. lives in Washington, the state of Washington. She writes, I'm a longtime listener. really enjoy the show. The Hangouts, you have never seemed to work out for me. I'd love to get together with people in your listener community that live in Spokane area. If you know of anyone, my husband and I are both retired. We live in the country, surrounded by conservatives. Very hard to meet people and have any conversations beyond the weather. Been a rough couple of years. Anyway, if you know anyone, please have them text hello, and I will respond. Barb Potter, Barb, if there's anybody in Spokane or wants to visit Barb and her husband in the Confederate area of, uh, of Washington State, email me, standupwithpeat at gmail.com, and I'll put you in touch with, uh, with Barb and her husband. Barb is great. And a lot more feedback on yesterday's show, as well as the show before that, uh, the day before with Noel and Jay Black. So thank you very much for all that. If you haven't listened to him, you're not going to want to miss it. Go listen and learn about Pete Coe and his journey, and I will definitely be featuring more listeners. It was really, really great. And Pete and many of those listeners will be joining me tonight at the Stand Up Community Happy Hour Hangout, which takes place almost every Thursday evening at 8 p.m. East. I hope to see you there tonight. You'll get an email with a link in the morning with the show and all the rest of the information, including a vitamin N picture. Take pictures of the outdoors. Nature, send them to me. No man-made objects if possible. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. If you're not a member of our community and you'd like to join, we'd love to have you. It's only $5 a month. I think that's like $50 a year to support this show. Many of you pay a lot more. Very generous community. Can't do it without those subscriptions. This is independent media, subscriber base. I got a couple of ads that I play from time to time for a little extra dough, but it's mostly you supporting the show. So we got to keep it going. Sign up now at standupwithpete.com. Oh, one more thing. Congratulations to Matt DeTota, who is a listener who lives in my community. He's also a teacher at my daughter's high school. And he and his wife, Rosa, just gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. And welcome to the world. Alessio is his name. And uh, always very excited when my friends become parents. And especially when guys become dads. I I always love to talk to them and hear about the excitement and and give them unsolicited advice that they didn't ask for. Congratulations, Van Rosa. Very excited for you guys. Okay, well, today on the show, I have got, speaking of listeners, Bill Boyle, I mentioned, but Dave Rothkopf 
joins me. He is always, always good here on the program. We had an awesome conversation, which I I think you're going to really like. Covered a lot of ground, as we always do. He is a Daily Beast columnist now, as well as the host of Deep State Radio, which is an awesome podcast. He's the CEO of the Rothkopf Group, which is a media company that produces podcasts. He's also the author of many books, including Running the World, the Inside Story of the National Security Council, and the Architects of American Power, and many more as well. He used to run Foreign Policy Magazine. He's a big deal, and it's always great to have him joining me. He's DJ Rothkopf on Twitter. Read him at The Daily Beast. Listen to the podcast. Let's do it, Dave. The always brilliant and completely excitable Dave Rothkopf joining me. Dave, thank you. The last time, you know, you, you were here, people absolutely loved our conversation. It got very personal about your your friend who you lost in your life, and, and it was just great. Thank you for joining me again. Thanks. I'll, I'll, uh, I don't know. I can't promise to be that excitable today, but I'll, I'll do it again. I'll get you worked up at some point. We'll okay. talk about, we'll talk okay. about, uh, you know, we could talk about maybe get you worked up because uh, I haven't seen you commenting. How do you, how do you feel about the, the new Saudi Arabian golf league? You, you look like a golfer. Never played golf. Oh, good. Don't think golf is a sport. Great. I think a sport really requires running and sweating and things like that. Sure. Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, professional athletes going for the money does not strike me as an unusual development. And, but, you know, there's a bigger issue here, which is this kind of phenomenon of sports washing, where countries that have lousy human rights records or they have lousy you know, they're doing other bad stuff. They say, hey, I have an idea. Let's host the World Cup or let's, you know, but, you know, you remember Putin going around in Sochi, you know, talking about what a great country Russia was. And the interesting thing is that these sports leagues are just all too eager to oblige and, you know, say, well, sure, give us give us hundreds of millions of dollars and we'll help you with your PR problem. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why we're setting the bar too high. We probably, you're right, we shouldn't be. But then you got the case of someone like Brittany Griner, who has to take the money and go play in Russia and then gets detained there for a, apparently a, a, a cannabis vape cartridge. And she's like in prison, the, the most uh, successful and celebrated female basketball player. But I guess it feels like we don't care enough about that. Well, we don't, although I think uh, from what I know about the case, the first couple of months she was incarcerated, the strategy was to keep it low key because they thought that if they made a big deal out of it, it would piss off the Russians. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, we were perfectly willing to piss off the Russians on so many other levels that the individual strategy on this didn't really make any difference. And this poor woman is 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 now going to be in a Russian prison at least through July second, I think. Yeah. OK, well, we can talk about how the American media is handling that or American government is handling it another time. But uh, I do want to talk to you about Russia. You've got a recent piece at The Daily Beast where you're a contributing columnist titled How Biden Can Help Ukraine Win the Long War. And I believe that this uh, was posted before the news of today that the Biden administration has announced additional one billion dollars in military aid for Ukraine. And my question to you is, you know, what is the status, the way you see it, of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine? It seems like they are they've regrouped and, and, and somehow created a strategy that seems to be working. And, and, and now apparently other reporting saying, you know, Putin has not given up on taking all of the country. Where is it as it stands? And what is this what is this news of the uh, of America giving a billion dollars military aid for Ukraine mean? Um. Well, that's a lot of questions. So let me let me start with the, the, the first. You know, I think we all make a mistake when we refer to, you know, the Russian invasion as though it started on February 24th. The Russian invasion started in 2014. Um, and most of the areas that Russia currently holds uh, are either areas they gained in 2014 or areas adjacent to those areas in eastern Ukraine. So... You know, I think we have to look at it in that context. Secondly, one of the things that the Russians were having trouble with in their invasion, the second invasion, this one that took place in February, was things like getting deep into Ukraine, supply lines, that kind of thing. 
Well, these regions that they're in now, they've been in a long time and they border Russia. So they have some advantages in that regard. Uh, the, the, the biggest advantage the Russians have, which is what I talked about in this article, is Americans' short attention span. Yes. If, you know, the degree to which we get distracted and we're talking about gas prices or we're talking about the January 6th committee or other things that are perfectly reasonable to talk about. But we don't care about Ukraine and we don't step up. Uh, the degree to which that also gives Europeans cover to do less, uh, well, that that puts Ukrainians in a weakened position, uh, and Putin is counting on it. He's counting on us not being there for the long haul. <clears throat> I think that's why Biden's billion dollars today is important. It says we are still in this. We are still committed. It's not what the Ukrainians need. And I, I think that was the other point that I made. You know, I don't think we should be sort of penny wise and pound foolish on this thing. I think if it's a choice between giving the Ukrainians slightly more than we think they need or slightly less, give them more, you know, because they're not just fighting to save their country. They're fighting to defeat Russia. They're fighting to send a message to Russia that when you invade your neighbors, you pay a very high price. This, however, is going to be a debate I think we're going to have for a long time, because I think this war is going to go on for months and months and months. Uh, and in some of these regions that we see the Russians taking, uh, I think it's going to turn into an insurgency where there are going to be guerrillas fighting the Russians for a long, long time, which is going to be very hard for them. Because the reality is, and a lot of polling shows this, the people in these regions that Russia has conquered, even some of them, though they may have been ethnically Russian, they hate Russia now. Russia has destroyed their homes, their lives, the people around them. And, uh, you know, this is just going to come down to what wars of attrition come down to. Who's got the supply lines? Who's got the will to last it out? Um, and of all the world leaders other than President Zelensky that matters in this, Joe Biden is number one. And uh, if he can keep the alliance together and keep the U.S. writing the checks and sending the equipment, Ukraine's got a pretty good chance in the long haul. What about uh, you make one uh, really important point about natural gas supplies and the Russian economy? Um, everybody should read this whole piece for all the six points. But I just wanted to get you to elaborate on that, Dave. Well, you know, Russia's been continuing to cash checks. We put in all these uh, sanctions, but, you know, the, the bulk of the money that Russia gets in the world is, you know, selling natural gas to countries like the countries in Europe. And even though the European countries have said, OK, we're going to get off of dependency on Russian oil, it's the dependency on Russian gas that is really sort of propping up the Russian economy. We've known this for a long time. And uh, I think it's it's real important to find alternative sources for natural gas from for Europe. And after all, you know, we're the world's largest exporter of energy. So we should be able to help with that. And at the same time, find alternative kinds of energy that that get them off of the hook here. That includes, by the way, nuclear energy. You know, if following the Fukushima disaster, Chancellor Merkel had said, no, we're going to keep the nuclear plants running. They wouldn't need any Russian natural gas. Yeah. The reason they're dependent on Russian natural gas is because Germany turned off their nuclear plants in the wake of the Fukushima disaster. So there's a simple solution for the Germans. Simple, I think, is uh, unfair. Because they take forever okay. to build them, right? Uh all right. You, you, you know, you may be right. But, you know, to me, as in a complicated world, if the solution involves one action to return to something you were already doing, that's simpler than a lot of other options. It sounds like you conceded your point a tiny bit to me, which I'll take as a triumph for the rest of the week. You're Dave Rothkopf, for God's sake. So, so the last two episodes of your podcast, Deep State Radio, which if you like this one, you will, you will absolutely love that because you bring on the smartest people, a bunch of them at a time, talked about the issue of, of inflation. You had a, a really bang up panel of people, one of which had a British accent. Who is that? Is that Ed Lewis? Ed Lewis. So yeah. Ed Lewis of the financial. So he sounded just smarter automatically if you listen to the podcast. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, folks. It's really go, unfair. You know, for those of us who are from New Jersey, who yeah. don't have that kind of accent. The fact that there is this bias towards yeah. British accents, it's a it's it's an unfair burden. 
Well, I hear you, but have you heard you? Yeah. I mean, no. the, the, the content of what you're saying, Dave, is always brilliant, and I'm happy to have it. But, you know, you, you really should consider an accent. Thanks. Have you, is it too late? <laughs> oh, oh, that's OK. Well, uh, that's, I'm going to I'm going to record this and send it to the Summit New Jersey public school system and see if they can. Also, there know. should be some kind of anti uh, defamation league for American accents because they really do not impress. But the point is, it was a smart conversation and people should go listen to it. But maybe a, a, a takeaway from from that, you know, one question you ask is, will Biden's democracy focused foreign policy stand up to the problem of inflation? I'm not even smart enough to understand that question. His democracy focused foreign policy means uh, that we should be supporting those countries that generally support democracy over authoritarianism. But I'm not sure how that affects uh, the price of things. Well, it goes back to your first question about the Saudis. Biden has said that he's going to go to Saudi Arabia. Now, Biden, during the campaign, said Saudi Arabia should be a pariah. He condemned them for the murder of Khashoggi, and which he should have. And they have been isolated for, 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 for that, at which they should be. And now he's got a huge political problem in the United States. And the political problem is that if inflation stays high, Democrats are going to lose and he may lose in 2024. So he's had to balance that and go to this the, and came to the conclusion. If the Saudis can pump more gas, then we can bring down gas prices. And, you know, I think this is this is happening in a variety of, of, of other places where, you know, reality is catching up to what he said. I'm, I'm not condemning the actions. You know, average Americans have high prices. They want to deal with them. But another thing they're considering doing is cutting tariffs on Chinese goods. Well, the Chinese are winning no prizes for human rights or democracy or anything. But by cutting the tariffs, the goods get cheaper. This was not something that Donald Trump realized when he imposed the tariffs. You know, he, he thought that the Chinese would pay for the goods. But of, of course, it's American consumers that do. And 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 while you could you know say, well, Biden is, you know, is not standing up for his principles. And in, in one clear respect, he is, because what happens if high inflation leads to Republican win in November? A uh, hundred of the Republican primary candidates, according to The Washington Post, believe in the big lie. A lot of these candidates, you know, for jobs like Secretary of State and so forth, have said, you know, we're not going to we're not going to have things like fair elections again. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but inflation in the United States could be the enemy of keeping us as a democracy. And, you know, job number one for him is is to defend democracy at home. Very well said. Such an important point. And I guess a is that a real politic situation where Biden being, can be critical on the campaign? But when come uh, where we're at right now in the summer of 2022 and gas prices are over five dollars, most places and everything costs more. You got to do what you can with these authoritarians, these these well, horrible. You you can. I mean, I, it, you know, there's another thing about inflation, which, you, you know, your, your, your listeners need to sort of think about. Which is everybody who's saying, you know, this is Biden's inflation. It's complete baloney. The, the reality is Mark Zandi, this economist from, from Moody's, did a thing on this. You can go look it up. But of the sort of 8.5% inflation or whatever it is, almost all of it comes from something else. Most of it comes from Russia's war in Ukraine and rising gas prices and food prices associated with that. A lot of it comes from the COVID uh, back up in supply chains around the world and so forth. Of all of it, 0.1%, one-tenth of 1% comes from Biden economic policies. All the rest of it is, is global stuff. And, and you know, if you, if you don't believe me, look at what inflation is like everywhere else in the world. The, the, you know, it's, an, it's a global phenomenon. It's not an American phenomenon. And so if you're going to fix it, you got to go elsewhere. You got to go out into the world to try to do that. And of course, today we had the biggest interest rate hike in 30 years in the United States. Um, if you had a mortgage on your house, you're going to be in that house forever because 
that mortgage the mortgage rates in the U.S. are going to go up a lot in the next couple of uh, months or the in the year ahead. Well, if you um, have to buy them, uh, if you get a loan now, you mean because right because I think I'm now. locked in. No, but that's good. Congratulations! But you are locked <laughs> in in more ways than you thought oh, because yeah. if you want to get another mortgage now, you'll never get that rate again. Well, we're looking at a third house right now. Uh, so yeah. we'll, we'll see. That podcasting pays really well. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not the podcasting. I do something on the side I can't talk about. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. Dave making a lot of really good points, especially the point about inflation in the rest of the world. But nobody's listening to economists, great points and analysis in this country. And it's so easy to demagogue things like, oh, Biden's given a billion. I mean, Tucker Carlson will go on and go. Biden just apparently approved a billion dollars to send to Ukraine. What about, and he'll just name any number of things that people are dealing with here, and that'll be that, and Mark Zandi and economic analysis be, be damned. Yeah, well, that's the way it works, you yeah. know, because Tucker Carlson gets on TV every night, and he says Joe Biden has monkeys flying out of his ass, yeah. and the world goes, oh, of course, well, you know, that that's where those monkeys are coming from. And, and uh, you know, 40% of the people in the United States watch and believe that kind of stuff. And uh, that's why we've got the problem we've got. And the irony is almost always that whatever they're saying, often certainly Tucker Carlson and many of them, is they're projecting. So in, in effect, if, if you pan down on Tucker Carlson's set, you would see monkeys flying everywhere from his ass. But you don't. You just see his face. Yeah. And I'm honest. Personally, that's an image I could do without. But you make it's, a good point. Yeah, it's an image I'm actually going to have printed up and posted uh, as a logo. <laughs> so let me ask you about uh, the last episode of Deep State Radio and something that you've been talking a lot about. You had the uh, two amazing, uh, hard to beat Harry Lippman and Norm Ornstein. I don't know who books your show, but I may hire them away to replace my fake booker, uh, which is a great conversation about about day one uh, of the hearing. And everybody should go listen to that. But how important are are these hearings? I guess the second one will be today when I when I post my conversation here with you. And and by the way, Dave, why would they have it? I, I pretty much have very little like your guests and I think yourself in that episode. Not a lot of criticism. I'm not a big Benny Thompson fan in terms of his presentation. I don't know why they didn't have lead with video, but whatever. Uh, why is it at 10 o'clock in the morning now? That 8 o'clock p.m. thing was amazing. I hosted a thing around it. Why, why are we doing 10 a.m.? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think it's the right decision. I think they ought to do more in prime time. I think the audience for the prime time uh, hearing was 20 million people or something like yeah. that. It was really yeah. enormous. And it had an effect. I've, you know, there were Politico and Morning Consult came out with a poll the other day and something like two thirds of all Americans said, you know, people who try to steal the election ought to go to jail, including about half of Republicans. Wow. So all of, all of a sudden, you know, you've got, you know, it making impact. And, you know, whatever you may say about Benny Thompson, Liz Cheney has been extremely effective. Uh, Zoe Lofgren, yeah, the congresswoman who, who did the one on Monday, was quite effective. They've been really smart about one thing, which is they tend to look for new news, things that, has got, that are good, that is going to have an impact, and they package it in a very tight way, like yesterday, there wasn't a hearing, but they released a video of one of Trump's lawyers telling one of Trump's other lawyers or recounting telling one of Trump's other lawyers that he needed to get a criminal attorney. And, you know, last night on CNN and MSNBC and everything, they were showing this video yeah. over and over again. So they might as well have been having a primetime hearing. Um, and, you know, they have the former president of ABC News advising them. And all of a sudden, we're seeing things we've never seen before in a hearing. So, for example, no long speeches by Congress people. For example, the videos are all cut real tight. You know, if Ivanka Trump said something, you know, uh, shocking, like, I believe Bill Barr, I don't believe my father, which is what she said last week. It's, you know, that's an 18 second clip. So you don't have to watch a lot of right. tedious stuff. Um, and, uh, did you hear Trump's uh, response to that? By the way, his response was, I never heard of Ivanka. Yeah, right. Exactly. And by the way, your impression is really good, but you know, they did it again, uh, today, the day that we're taping this by releasing clips of a tour by a congressman who's named like Loudermilk or something like that of taking people through the Capitol. And even after, you know, the Capitol 
you know, management had said something to the effect of there hadn't been these tours. They're here. They're on video or a bunch of people in MAGA hats walking through the Congress a building, taking pictures of stairwells and doors, uh, the, you know, the day before the January 6th attack. And then they took a photo of the one of the people. And they got the video of the guy participating in the January 6th assault. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, a, a tweet like that um, and turnabout is fair play. There's a nice irony that they're going after Trump with a Twitter strategy. But a tweet like that can have much more. I mean, you know, I'm, frankly, I think that tweet probably had more impact than the impeachment hearings did in their totality. The tweet about the tour. Well, the tweet about the tour, the tweet about, you know, yesterday about the lawyer who telling, you know, Eastman that he really needed to get a criminal right, defense right, right, attorney. Right, right, right. Oh, the way that the tweets. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Follow that. Yeah. Putting it out, laying out the evidence on social media in short bites is highly effective. Is what you think you're saying? That's digestible. That yep. can go viral, be shared, shape opinions. Your, uh, I think your most recent piece of the Daily Beast I just want to ask you about is uh, here's what the world's media thinks of the January 6th hearings. And you aggregated, uh, you know media from all countries all over the world. Uh, and I I was struck on day one of the hearings when they showed, I think I'd never seen this video of an empty house chamber where people had left all of their stuff because clearly they just ran out. And I remember seeing that, Dave, and going, that that looks like maybe the, that would happen in like the Turkish parliament or some South American, you know, a state house or something like that. And, and then I realized, oh no, that, that's America where that happened. It made me think how the rest of the world sees us. Well, you've aggregated it. People should read it. But, you know, what did you learn when when uh, looking into the reactions of of international viewers, publics, newspapers and media to our January 6 hearings? I think a lot of them are reporting it as kind of inside, you know, inside baseball story of of of. Uh, of the U.S. In other words, you know, it was kind of like, well, they're the Republicans and the Democrats fighting again. Yeah. And they weren't really looking at it from the point of view that if this hearing doesn't work, if Trump isn't held accountable, if democracy in the U.S. takes any more blows, it's got a huge global consequence. We're the leading democracy in the world. We have fought wars for democracy. We've funded wars for democracy. I'm not saying we're perfect, but if we stop being a democracy, Every other democracy in the world is at much greater risk. And every other country that aspires to democracy uh, has their uh, the, the prospects much dimmer. And so uh, I and I don't think they recognize that. I don't think people realize how grievous the threat to democracy is. Now, I, I will tell you that the, 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 my actual latest Daily Beast piece, which is sort of coming out probably roughly the same time that this podcast are, is going to come out, is is a little more optimistic. And it says the January 6th hearings, the fact that Republicans are starting to be willing to speak out and go on the record against Trump, the fact that, that there is actually some bipartisan movement on gun control, the fact that Fox is now televising these hearings and this morning consult poll shows that it's really changing views. These are encouraging things, you know, and, and the reality is this. We had an attempted coup. We didn't have a coup. There were enough people, even some really bad people. Bill Barr is, you know, does not deserve a medal for anything. But they, they drew a line. Yeah. It was like, let's not overthrow the government of the United States. You know, Bill Barr, I'll throw children in cages and I'll let Trump have his grip. But let's not. Well, you know, I'm glad there was a line there. That's a positive thing for our country. And so there, there are there are some glimmers of, of hope happening out there. Last thing I just saw your tweet is Elon Musk is such a terrible person, is all I want to say. You, you point out that he, he apparently is, you know, throwing support. He was asked who you support for president. He said he said DeSantis. And you made a really good point on, on Twitter. People give him a lot of credit for, you know, Solar City or rather uh, Tesla solar panels, for which I have in my house, and and Tesla renewable vehicles and being a champion for green energy. 
But none of that matters. None of it. If he supports politicians and leaders who are climate denialists, much less anti green energy. I think that's that's your point with with that tweet. Like, I mean, that was one of my points. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, Elon Musk seems to be on a campaign to prove to the world, you know, what an odious guy he is in as many different ways as possible. And supporting <laughs> yeah, DeSantis yeah. Yeah. is certainly one way to do that, because DeSantis is. Per, you know, per, uh, you know, pretty creepy um, a guy who on a daily basis is 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 demonstrating kind of the worst of the extreme right wing in the United States. But the extreme right wing in the United States hates green energy. They they hate this. And yet somehow Elon Musk, who sells himself as this, you know, uh, advocate champion of next generation technologies, he doesn't care about that. And you wouldn't know why. First, Elon Musk isn't really a champion of green tech. He didn't invent that company. Right. He didn't invent those technologies. He invested in it to make money. And that gets to the second point, which is Elon Musk is about one thing and one thing only, increasing Elon Musk's bank account. And, uh, you know, if that means lower taxes, he's for him. And that's why the right wing gets a lot of these guys to line up because they, they just know they'll keep more of their their money. Um, I, a footnote to this story is that when asked about this today, DeSantis made this really slimy joke saying, well, I welcome the support of African-Americans Oh, because, because Elon African. Musk, Elon Musk is from South Africa. Oh. Um, and so it was kind of like, I'm a scumball racist and I'm going to make a joke about it. Um, I mean, it, they deserve each other. It's just none of us deserve either of them. So well said, Dave. So well said. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we learned that that uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, tried to buy a woman's silence with two hundred fifty thousand dollars and a horse. Remember that? And then it went away yeah. for it seemingly. And he's still. And, and no, no, he's and he's just going to keep on going. And, yeah. you know, I saw some articles talking about this or some, you know, comments on this. And they're saying, you know, this is the world's one of the world's most powerful people. Well, he's only powerful if we make him powerful. Very you well. Know, said. He's only powerful if he's influential. But the, the amazing thing is the number of trolls and bots and whatever else out there who immediately defend this dude. Yeah. Um, who, you know, rips off his employees, rips off his customers, um, uh, and seems to be dedicated to the idea of turning the U.S. into a, a, a right-wing country. Yeah, well, there's always going to be those people who, uh, you know, whether it be Johnny Depp, I don't know about that story, but they just, you know, they, they jump on the trolls. They just jump on to uh, for the ride, I guess, not, not out of principle, just to get. A hit. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, Dave, so great to talk with you again. I always appreciate your time. I love reading you at the Beast, and I love listening to Deep State Radio. It is such an informative podcast, and uh, I really thank you for joining me as always. And just uh, uh, we're doing like a uh, for my show, we're doing like a golf thing. We want to know if you want to come, like just a gathering of people who who want to golf. I know you don't like it, but any interest, Dave, to join us? Well, well, I you know really support what you're doing, Pete, and I really um, think you're making a big difference. Um, but I'm vehemently opposed to golf. Yeah. I think it's a Republican plot. Yeah, I, I tennis player. I feel tennis players and golf players are like the the cattlemen and the sheep herders of the old west. <laughs> you know, that, that just doesn't mix. Um, yeah. So I wish you well with this. And when you start your, your tennis outing, yeah. I'll be there. Okay. So we may, maybe we'll change it to tennis then just to get you out. But I'll put you down for golf anyway. And if you show up, you do. Uh, <laughs> put, put me down. That's what everybody else does. <laughs> Dave, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. There you go. The great Dave Roth cop. Read him at the Daily Beast. Listen to the podcast Deep State Radio. I think he posts a couple of we a week. And uh, always great. Follow him on Twitter at DJ Roth Kopf as well. Definitely let him know that you heard him here 
on the show. He is always so great to join me and one of becoming one of my favorite guests and people to read, certainly to follow on Twitter, Dave Rothkopf. All right, now coming up, joining me is another one of your favorite regulars. He is obviously a, a longtime listener and former caller at the old show, became a guest on the new show, and one of the most respected people in the community as well. Very thoughtful, very well read. You know him as a, a business owner down in Washington, D.C. If you're ever there, you need a place to park, call Bill B. in D.C. That's his Twitter handle, at Bill B. In D.C., several things, some of the similar issues I wanted to talk about with Dave Rothkopf that I wanted to catch up with Bill. And so we caught up late last night. He'd been out drinking, so I don't know exactly how this is going to go. But let's check it out right now with Bill B. Bill Boyle in Washington, D.C. Peter, can you hear me? Yeah, you're on the air, Bill Boyle. Bill in uh, D.C., you're on the air. Remember those days when you'd call in, I'd see you there, and I'd be like... Let it rip, Bill, especially if yeah. it was about... Sometimes I'd even text you, like, Alfred's <laughs> saying weird things. I wonder what your thoughts are. <laughs> exactly. This sounds like bullshit. Please call and yell. Yes. Call and yes. yell. The good old days. The good old days. The good old days. You were having some good old days tonight, Bill, because you were you were out having beers with friends. You sent me a picture of one of the beers, which uh, had, a, had a fun-looking label. It said, proud to say gay pilsner. Uh, yes. Where were you, and, and why were you drinking proud to say gay? Gay. We support having, let's say, safe schools for all LGBTQ kids and families. Wow, activist beer. Yeah, well, I actually marched in the Gay Pride Parade in uh, D.C. last Saturday. Oh, okay. That's what that's from? It, that is not from that, but when I went out to buy beer last weekend, I thought, oh, that looks pretty funny, so I'm going to buy it. So. You marched in. How did you did you get uh, an ally invite or uh, I? Yes, I, I marched with my wife's company, which is a company that supports uh, NASA. And they were marching in the parade. And I thought that I was coming to pick up, drop off, move around. And the next thing I knew, I was handing out beads, walking down 14th Street in the middle of, you know, 50,000 people. The gay parade is a gay thing. Gay gatherings are a lot of fun. A lot, of, a lot of joy. Outside the fear of being targeted by Patriot Front, they can be a lot of fun. Yeah, and this was really great. It was not political in any way. I, I was wearing a anti-Trump shirt, and I think I was the only one that I saw. Um, it was a really fun thing. Like People were just into it and into the, into the vibe of it. Although a gay friend of mine saw me from the sidelines and you know looked in disbelief mm -hmm. at my you know, middle-aged, enormously straight Irish guy sort of vibe and said, like, well, were we out of gay people? What the hell is going <laughs> on? <laughs> I would so, agree. I would agree. Uh, you are enormously straight seeming. You seem very you know, I, on the straight I, I, end of well, the spectrum to me. Never, yeah, well, never, I, not even, uh, not even one dick in your past. Uh, you had a few beers. So this is a safe space, buddy. No, you know, I got to tell you something. I, I have always said this. If I was ever attracted to one, I would have gone for it. And it just... I don't think there's one out there that has the right plumbing for me. Oh, no, you're you're coming coming from my preferences. I see what you did there. So that's yeah, cool. You know, like I, I never understood people being freaked out about it, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. And uh, it maybe that's uh, why I am so even, even growing up. Great. Even <laughs> uh, even growing up, you uh, did you? Who was your first gay? Uh, you know, person in your life that made it seem normal to you was there any a na neighbor or relative uh you have uh, several siblings no one came up aces well, i mean i have i have um close gay family mm. um i had you know like lots of folks sort of around who you know i grew up in an irish catholic environment that was very religious but also quite liberal and so it was the sort of thing back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s where if you knew you just didn't talk about it, it was considered to be none of your goddamn business. And and that that applied to priests as well. I mean, my mm. parish had numerous gay priests, and nobody cared at all. Hmm. Not at all. Really? It was a very, it was in its own way, you know, I think there was that honeymoon period for gay people in the 70s and 80s that ended in the early 80s. And I think that I grew up in that sort of period. I mean, you know, my, my father, you know, as you know, is basically a guy from the Depression. And he just never 
you know, he doesn't want to talk about it. It's it's not a thing he would ever discuss. But he is going to be, you know, arsed if he's going to let you abuse somebody for being gay. Is that right? Oh, my God. He thinks that's like awful and ridiculous. And mm. but it comes from that place of whatever I think of it. It's none of my goddamn business. Right. You know, sensing adults, no one getting hurt. Why would I care? Right. That's his take on it. And, and, you know, that's, that's the vibe that I grew up in. It was in its own way, not accepting, but in another way, it was quite accepting. And I think it was not a bad base to start with. Right. Um, because at, at minimum you understood that, you know, you should judge yourself first and not worry much about anyone else. Wow. I wasn't planning on getting into that, but I really interesting. I always love your perspective on everything, including that and the fact that you marched in the in the gay parade is fun and uh, glad to hear it. I'm gonna do that at some point if I ever get invited. I'm just gonna walk in and uh, and dress as flamboyant as possible and enjoy myself and and let my freak flag wave because it's who I am. But let me ask you. Yeah, I, think, I, I think I should point out you get a lot of attention from women when you march in a gay parade. Is that right? It's what I noticed. It was yeah. rather. Hilarious. Well, actually. as you as you know, I get enough attention from the ladies. It's always been. It's the you know, it's the late puberty no hair thing. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a real there's a real lane a, for a good. guy like me who is that yeah. honest. I think <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, let me ask you about. Let me ask. Be underestimated. I'm sorry, I stepped on what was probably a, a decent joke. I said the Florence Nightingale effect is not to be underestimated. <laughs> Uh, more true than you know. Uh, in my early twenties, it was a real something or else uh, with the older ladies at my gym. Uh, but yeah, they taught me a lot. Thank you to all of them for laying yes. the groundwork of what became a great, great lover. Okay, so uh, you shared this tweet, which I don't think it needs too much context. But uh, someone named a Andrea Junker, who you follow, I guess, or you shared this. It uh, it reads. Let me state the obvious. When people photograph the U.S. Capitol's hallways, staircases, offices, security checkpoints, and entrances of the secret underground tunnel system, there's 100% chance that they don't have tourist photo albums in mind. Bill, let's start there in terms of your reaction to the news of these tours that we've been hearing reported about, but this new video of uh, one congressman, uh, one of the people he showed around, apparently showed up at the rally with a sharpened flag and uh, your thoughts on that being a, a a dc resident and a political analyst i i think that it is interesting in that the congressman who is louder milk i believe felt compelled yeah. to lie about it i think that is the really interesting part of it it would have been very easy to say sure i did a tour and what was the big deal and no one did anything weird and it was fine and you people are crazy for assuming that it's a bad thing. The fact that he, he didn't just like deny it. He denied it categorically. And like in January of this year, so he had a full year to think about it. And he still denied it. Like so categorically that now he looks ridiculous and he looks suspect. The people taking those pictures, I think that is not as dispositive of, you know, something super shady as people hope it would be or believe it would be, but it doesn't look good. And, I suspect that that leak is not accidental that it's coming out today when they're having another hearing on this exact sort of topic tomorrow. I think they're they're tipping us off to something that's going to be bombshelly tomorrow on that front. Oh, interesting. Well, we will soon find out. It's uh, day three of the hearings. Why do you know? Do you have any idea why they moved them to 10 a.m. the other day and then 1 p.m. today? This is today when we're talking, you know, uh, well, so why move them out of prime time, Bill? I mean, Jesus, it, it was so great. It, it, more people watched it than watched anything else. The news. I, I think what they're doing. So it, people are, people are need to understand that you can't do this every night at prime time for two weeks and keep people's interest. You're not going to keep it. Oh, I don't know if I agree. I do. I, I, I honestly think like the people that are going, wait, what? They should be doing this every single night. I think that's ridiculous. It wouldn't work. What you need to do is build up crescendos. And I think next week or the week after is going to be a really big one, but they're going to, they're building up a case on Trump and how he treated Pence, how he tried to pressure Pence, how he got the crowd to be there for, to pressure Pence um, and to pressure Congress, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're building up to the final chapter of this, which is going to be prime time where they say, 
this was an attempted coup. We've gone through all the evidence for the last week or two or three. And it's clear that there need to be indictments of the former president and various other people for this. And that you want on prime time, too. I mean, don't think people are not paying attention to this. This is really getting a lot of attention. But you're not going to get the networks to both put it on prime time and then report it endlessly the next day if you're on prime time every night. You're not. Um, and, and the guy who did all those amazing hard hitting things on Nightline for years, who is the director of all of this, he knows what he's doing. And, and if this is the way he's doing it, I, I think I got to trust him. I'm just some guy who runs parking garages. <laughs> all right. Well, right. day three of the hearings uh, were postponed. And, uh, so we'll see what uh, happens we'll see, yeah. you know, to, to now today, right? This is what I'm talking about. But, yeah. but, uh, what do you think about the first couple of days? I don't think I talked to you since the, the first hearing. Are you, are you impressed with, with, with what we've seen and, and how, what kind of position do you think it, it puts the department of justice in? I, I heard some great an- uh, analysis. I think it was Harry Lippman. And others, right. I think a lot of people saying this, like it, it'll be the hard, hard for the justice, the Department of Justice to prosecute Trump and and others, uh, but it'd be harder for them not to. Right. So so weirdly enough, today I went on a long drive with my son for three hours. Yeah. And, and what does Finn bored. think about the implications? Well, so the, the, this is interesting because Finn actually said, you know, I know you go on Pete's podcast and I want to hear one. So I randomly picked the one where you and I before the first hearing talked about what they what was going to happen and what they needed to do and so i got to listen to what i said whatever that was 10 days ago ah great and what's interesting is that what i said was that the point of these hearings and what they have to accomplish is to make it impossible for merrick garland not to indict that's what you're aiming for and so what i've seen so far looks precisely like that is what they are doing they are, and and that's again why I'm not particularly concerned about a 10 a.m., a 10 a.m., and then another primetime one, et cetera. They want the public pressure to be up to a certain pitch so that that also makes it clear to Gar- Garland that there's a big public interest in doing this. But who they're really talking to in general is Garland on the evidence and on the facts that they come up with and on the obvious crimes that they're going to illustrate were committed. That's what they're aiming at. And I, and I think, by the way, it is not accidental that Terrio and, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the Oath Keepers guy who got, they got indicted for seditious uh, conspiracy right before the first hearing started. Right. right? And, and to me, this feels like Garland is watching this. Garland has just teed up the guys who were really the armed tip of the attack during the insurrection on Congress. And now Garland is getting tons of evidence and background and and, you know, potential predicate causes on the people who organized it and who, you know, who who begged for it to happen, meaning Trump, Meadows, Loudermilk, guys like that. Stuart Rhodes so, is the Oath Keepers guy. Thank you. Yes. And yeah. and so so I, I think that that, you know, what you and I talked about before this started, I think that that is looking pretty much on the ball that that this is being set up as a way to really make it clear you know garland i i'm not a critic of garland and i think that he understands that you can't start this case and then lose it right you can't that makes trump stronger so if you're going to bring this case against the former president you're coming at the king and you better kill him and i think that that's what congress is providing for for, for Merrick Garland right now is enough bullets that he's not going to lose that case if he decides to do it. Uh, yeah, well said. I think very well said. I'm looking through your tweets here, and uh, you had you had a lot to say about Rudy Giuliani the other day. You want to share any thoughts about the? <laughs> fa- I mean, where where are, it's kind of why I say keep it in prime time and. And it, it's so damn entertaining. And Democrats have always had a hard time making things entertaining because liberal minded, progressive minded folks like nuance and, and data for arguments and right. politics and so on. And, and so, but th- this is absolutely fascinating. Rudy Giuliani, I'm arguing, had one of the furthest falls from grace in the history of, of America. Right. And he was referred to by Liz Cheney as being inebriated. Everybody's talking about 
how drunk he has always been. And on that night of all nights, I mean, obviously, it sounds like he's got a real <laughs> issue. But good God, surrounding yourself with someone like that, listening to them. Uh, what are your thoughts? Just quickly. Sorry, I'm ranting about Rudy. No, that's OK. So I think what's interesting about that is that it is not a gratuitous thing to, to nail Giuliani for being a drunk and lunatic. Because what they're showing is that Trump was going out of his way to completely avoid the advice of anyone who had any anything to put together in their, you know, like anyone who had their act together. Trump was going out of his way to avoid their advice. And, you know, you had people talking about lawyers talking about how they went to Trump and they would talk about, OK, here's issue one. You're claiming X. We can show that that's not true. Trump would go, OK, fine. No problem. What about this? They would blow the next thing out. He would say, OK, what about this? In other words, they're illustrating that Trump was literally just looking for anything that would justify what he wanted to do. He wasn't mistaken, in other yeah. words. Yeah. He wasn't yeah. was confused. He didn't yeah. believe something that wasn't true and he had a strong belief. He didn't care what he believed. He cared in launching a coup. And that's what they're showing. They're showing that Trump had all these people in the room. You know, Jason Miller and these guys are scum. And they are some of the worst people. And even they were saying, hey, we're team reality. He didn't win. Team normal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Team normal. Sorry, right. And so, you know, the, the fact that he took Giuliani and took Giuliani as such a drunk and such a lunatic isn't accidental that they're emphasizing that. They're emphasizing it because they're showing that Trump was looking for any handhold and he didn't care at all what that handhold was. I think that, by the way, my, my tweet about Giuliani, um, Jimmy, um, Jimmy Breslin back in the day, comparing Giuliani to Mussolini, said that he was just a short man looking for a balcony. Oh, is that right? Yes. And so that's why I tweeted just a short, drunk man looking for a balcony. <laughs> that's so great, Jimmy, Bill. Jimmy Breslin and uh, your friend John Avalon will get a kick out of that quote because it's a, or that paraphrase because it's a, uh, it's a genius Breslin, you know, epitome of Giuliani from 40, 50 years ago. I, I think it's, it perfectly. I think it's worth mentioning if I have this correctly, Jason Miller and Steppy and all these people who either you knew their names, or you're learning their names and you're certainly realizing how close they were to the president, what their roles were, the lawyers that you didn't know about uh, there. They, they had to give they were subpoenaed and had to give depositions under oath. And that is it's worth mentioning. That's the reason why they're not able to lie the way they Correct. would if they made television appearances. It's why Peter Navarro goes on Ari Melber and says whatever the hell, but doesn't sit down with the panel. Same thing you might argue with Bannon. So it's worth mentioning. There's a big difference when you are given a deposition as a result of a subpoena testifying under oath. Do, do, is that right? I should probably be asking a lawyer that question, but it seems like that's why we're hearing these scumbags have to come clean about what they knew and what they told the president, uh, thus proving the president knew exactly uh, the truth until, of course, his psychology is, and he's always been this way, to bring in people to tell him whatever he wants to hear and then throw out everybody else and fire them. Well, well Pete, I'm not a lawyer, but let me give you the parking guy answer to that question. <laughs> Giuliani claimed that Miller and everyone else were total liars talking about how he was drunk the night of the election. Um, and they said this under oath, by the way. Well, Giuliani then put those tweets up saying you're complete liars and, you know, you must be paid by the deep state or whatever. Mm -hmm. He then took those tweets down within 12 hours. Yeah, why? That was just the last couple of days, you're saying. Well, the, the reason he took it down is that those people made those statements under oath, which he, he which meant that he was then accusing them of perjury. And they clearly could prove it and they were willing to prove it in order to defend themselves from being claimed, being accused of perjury. Right. Yeah. And that is a perfect example of how like, like the fact that they were under oath really makes a difference because that would have just been, you know, Giuliano said whatever he said and no one would have cared. It would have just been ignored. Now it literally was demonstrated as true on Giuliani's Twitter feed himself in the last two days. Because he had to, you know, he had to pull those tweets because he was all of a sudden realizing, oh, crap, I could get sued and they can prove it. Right. So so a small and funny and not super important example of what being under oath does, but it, it demonstrates it. Right. I mean, these folks are 
are now stuck with their testimony and forced to defend it, even when probably they would rather not. Amazing. Uh, always great observations, even though yeah, you're not a lawyer. Uh, I don't know how you know those things. Uh, but uh, well said. All right. I want to ask you about what is happening in Ukraine. And I had Dave Rothkopf on just before you here. People will, if they listen in order, uh, people love Bill B so much. They might, they might skip ahead. I don't know. But uh, Dave uh, reacted to, and I want to get your reaction to the approval of $1 billion being sent for, I guess, arms and defense for uh, for Ukraine from us, from U.S. Uh, Biden apparently sending this uh, too little too late. I don't know what is happening in Ukraine. Dave said, you know, we're a long, still a long way to go and that we should certainly talk about this war beginning in 2014 with the invasion annexation of Crimea. People forget that and count the days since it began at the end of February, which he, he thinks is the wrong framing. But he says it goes on for for months more. Bill, you're paying very close attention to what's happening there. The military strategies, the politics, of course, the history of it all. And uh, also hearing this week that Putin apparently is saying, no, he wants all of Ukraine. He, he's he's never going to stop. Oh, and also, is he uh, terminally ill? Bill. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Um, but that is, let's hope that Putin is terminally, terminally ill. But Something you should probably literally take this clip and send it to Rothkopf because I would love to hear his take on it. And and it is this. The United States and the Western democracies, they train and they equip and they prepare themselves so both psychologically and politically for intense but short wars. They have this idea that we're going to be, you know, we're going to beat the crap out of everybody in a conventional war very quickly with these really high tech, really effective, really powerful systems. And then the war will be over in three months. And that's all well and good when those are the wars that you're in, those are the wars you can fight. Ukraine is not that war. Ukraine is a war where the really decisive elements of warfare, meaning air power and tank, uh, tank you know, formations, have been really greatly limited by man pads, by javelins, by all the rest. And so this is a war where we are not going to have a quick, decisive war. And by the way, we wouldn't want one because the country with the ability, at least on some level, to be quick and decisive at the beginning of this war was Russia. Ukraine was not prepared for that kind of war. And thank God they weren't because Ukraine is was designed or at least you know happened to be well designed for a longer term resistance based on infantry that that can be sustained really for ever as long as they are supported reasonably well and by the way even if we didn't support them the russians would be settling into a 20 year long insurgency right now okay so hmm. well the insurgencies have to be that, supported as well but it would it would be believe me by the poland romania whoever turkey everybody but it would be, could be supported at 150th of what we're doing now and go on for, for decades. What, what's happening right now, because of our, the way that we are set up to fight wars, is that we're running low on the stocks of things that Ukraine needs. And we are not going to strip our own active duty military to supply them for a billion different reasons that I'm sure you understand. We need to be able to fight China if China goes for Taiwan as one simple example. So. Is it too little too late? No, it's never too little too late. Is, is it a sign that our support for Ukraine is flagging? No. I mean, we're, we're actually escalating. We've escalated in many ways, and we're giving them pretty much everything we can that's useful to them, um, short of a no-fly zone, short of something that will very clearly lead to a nuclear war. And, and, and David Rothkopf is right. We need to get over this idea that this war is going to be over in 120 days. It's not how most wars between large countries work. And we're going to have down periods and we're going to have up periods. We're going to have periods where Ukraine has great victories and great losses and Russia the same. Um, you know, we need to commit because this fight is not about a border dispute between Russia and Ukraine. This fight is about what you just talked about a minute ago, that Russia has decided that it is now an imperial power again. And it wants to take back not just Ukraine, frankly, it wants to take the Baltic states back as well. It wants to force Finland back into a supplicant state status. It wants to be able to throw its weight around in Eastern Europe. 
Russia has gone back to its imperial project um, delusionally, but it has. And, and we need to think about what kind of world we would be living in if we allowed that to happen. And honestly, there's no choice at all in that matter. You know, we can let the world turn into a really crappy 1930s style, you know, collection of kleptocracies or not. And we're not mm. going to do that. And, and so we need to get over this sort of flipping out in, in ecstasy when the Ukrainians do great one week and then falling into incredible depression when they do badly the next. It's a war. There's going to be da- bad weeks and good weeks. And it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of blood. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, cold or cruel about this. But when I talk to people and they're like, oh, my God, the Ukrainians are losing 100 men a day. Yeah, I saw that yesterday. Yeah, something like that. What the actual fuck do you think happens in a large war? Hmm. Right? That's what happens. People, people die. People get badly hurt. People get wounded for life. The Ukrainians are, are upset about that, but they're not walking around going, oh, I can't believe this is happening. They know what they're fighting for. You know, we shouldn't look at that as like, I guess we're losing. We should look at that as look at what the Ukrainians are willing to do to defend, in effect, every democracy in the world. And we should we should see them that way and support them in that in that regard. Well, I. uh I think I agree with that. And I, you know, the, the domestic, how, however, this foreign policy affects domestic politics will be certainly interesting this time around with this conflict with this kind of money funding flowing from the federal government as, uh, you know, portioned yeah. or signed off by the Democratic president and, and how that gets demagogued in terms of, oh, gas prices back home and our southern border being invaded. And you're giving a billion dollars right. to the Ukrainians to fight a guy that we don't even dislike anymore Vladimir Putin and his super masculine <laughs> I, I will say legion this. of doom I, yeah I, I think there's if there's one policy in America right now that unites Republicans and Democrats it's the decision to keep fighting the Russians well People in, in Congress but not to, in right wing media but you know what you look at the polling and you look at it's 80 85 89 percent all right both on uh, both sides of the aisle well, on actual voters and and I don't think I, I I obviously do not want DeSantis or some other lunatic to win the White House in 2024. But I think that the Russians are, are let's just say they don't have a great track record of guessing what's going to happen with American administrations. And I think they'll be in for a very ugly surprise no matter who's in the White House in 2024. Well, OK, you just mentioned DeSantis. Let me just ask you this and I'll let you go, Bill. But but the uh, <laughs> there seems to be a situation shaping up. Where Donald Trump could be facing off against Ron DeSantis. And yep. w- what happens there? I read today, I know we don't like Chris Salissa, but I just read uh, something that he wrote about DeSantis has like a, a, a crazy amount of money in his right. campaign account. 112 million reasons why Donald Trump should be worried about Ron DeSantis. Maybe that's a bad Chris Salissa take. I don't know. But right. it's shaping up to be a real interesting civil war. And yeah. today, Elon Musk threw support for DeSantis, which, as Dave Rothkopf talked about earlier, was just the, the, the most Elon Musk thing to do. This guy who tries to fashion himself as a renewable energy warrior with the solar city, right. Tesla, solar panels and cars and always talking about it uh, and advocating for it, but yet throwing his support behind a climate denialist, a guy who won't even allow the words to be mentioned in the, in the state house, much less a guy who, by the way, is currently sunsetting invest uh, incentives for solar bill. Exactly. That's the guy Elon Musk today said. Anyway, DeSantis Trump, what what's going to happen? That's a really good question. I, I think Trump is running. And I think that right now Trump beats the crap out of DeSantis, no matter what happens. Um, I think if you're DeSantis, you're betting that Trump gets mm-hmm. indicted. And or dies before it's probably. <laughs> yeah, those are the only uh, I, I two. Just think, I think he doesn't. If you're DeSantis, by the way, you know, you might as well get ready for this fight because if the last thing you want to do is not be ready. And then, you know, Trump slips on the Diet Coke can and smacks his head and is gone. Um, you know, and I think DeSantis will run against him. And I think that Trump will, you know, eat his young as he always does. And. And DeSantis will lose to him, but if Trump's out. Mm. I think DeSantis is the clearly the front runner. Oh yeah, no, I agree. Well, I, w- I wonder why you think that Trump. 
just because he, he eats every lie, he's gonna he's gonna say Ron DeSantis, his wife uh, had an affair with Jeff Epstein. Okay, yeah, they'll come up with something. <laughs> you know, it's not. This is all about He'll attack you know, his wife, and, and then okay. and then DeSantis will allow for it after he loses and sign on to support Trump. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, by the way, Finn Boyle wants yeah. to ask you why you've never been in a Pride March. Hold on. Hi. Hey, Finn. I heard you went to the Pride March uh, this uh, this weekend. Your your parents marched in it. What? The Pride March. You were there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I was marching in the in the actual the NASA. Not really float, but more of like a. Yeah. I see the your your dad posted a picture. Uh, they were chanting "Gays in space." Yes. That's very cool. Someone- Someone thought it was days in space, oh. and they and they asked um, how many days in space, and it took a while for the, them to figure out it was gays, not yes, days. Yes, that's, that's a real misunderstanding that, that took place. Somebody should have thought about that before they began the chant, but nonetheless, sounds like you had a, a great time, and I know I've never been, you know, Finn, I've just never been in the city on the same day as the mm-hmm. parade, that's all. Yeah. You don't believe me, do you? Mm. Yeah. All right. Mm. Maybe next year. Huh? Maybe maybe next year, Finn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we were chanting gays in space, by the way, with ten thousand so, people. It's kind of so amazing. great. What yeah. It's so great. Gays <laughs> everywhere. Gays everywhere, especially in space. Yeah. And Oklahoma. I'm telling you, they're there. Oh, I I would I'm sure they are. I'm uh, sure they Bill, are very angrily. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, I'll let you get uh, the kid to bed, you to bed. Appreciate you staying up late with me and, and talking to me. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll uh, see what happens. When is their their ten o'clock tomorrow? And then what are they Monday again? Uh, you know what? I don't know the the hearings. I don't know. I don't have the yeah, calendar. I think they go next me. week, and then that's it. Yeah. We also um, have. But if uh, I had a bet I think there's indictments coming out of this from the Department of Justice. Yep. And they would have to be soon too. Uh, soonish. Well, you yeah. get the you soon-ish. get this OLC memo that everybody talks about, and you got the the ele- the midterm elections, and if Republicans take over in January, so they, they'd have to be between now and January of twenty twenty five. Right. Right. Yeah. Because so there's time. Yeah. There's time. Uh, all right, bud. Thank you very right. very much. Absolutely, buddy. Talk take care. Soon. Later. Bye. And there he goes, Bill B. in D.C. on the Twitter. Always great to catch up with him. People love him. People love when he's on. And so I try to have him on as much as I can and uh, recap a lot with him. I know there's a lot of similar subject matter with with Dave and Bill, uh, and I try to cover different things, as I did uh, with, the, with the biopic of Pete Coe yesterday. I definitely want to do more of those kind of listener profiles and, and getting to know you because I think... Uh, it really helps people. It really, I just get so much great feedback on that. So if you've had an interesting life and you want to share it, you got some expertise on something and you want to share that, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. We do a little pre-interview. We talk off the air. And if you want to, we can uh, we can talk and, and, and share it. And a lot of people can hear about your journey and it may just help others. It definitely will. It always does. All right. That's it for me. Thank you very much for listening today. Tell your friends. Spread the word. Put a rating up on the Apple Podcasts. If you've never done that, that goes a long way. And most importantly, sign up for a paid subscription if you haven't. Go to StandUpWithPete.com or Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Hope to see you tonight at The Hangout. Don't forget, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll recap the January 6th hearings. Maybe we'll get from some special guests as well. Who would you like to hear from? And uh, I'll see you there. John Carroll, take us out, buddy. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all.
they had to stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it is time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up 